if you couldn't tell from my channel name or logo, I may or may not like catfishes quite a bit. It's not hard to see why. There's over 2,500 species of swimming whiskered friends occupying niches as diverse as terrestrial burrower, the cave dweller, the apex predator. Sadly, not every species of catfish is still with us these days. In the case of Hypsidorus, this extends to, the, to its entire family. Our titular catfish genus was wiped out millions of years ago by unknown factors. Two species of Hypsidorus graced our planet in the Eocene, Hypsidorus oregonensis and Hypsidorus farsonensis. The Eocene was a strange era. Since the non-avian dinosaurs were freshly wiped off the map, new groups of mammals and birds quickly rose up to fill those vacant niches. The planet was much warmer, to the point where tropical or organisms like palm trees and crocodilians lived as far north as the Pacific Northwest. Underwater, Teleos fishes were beginning to heavily outcompete the more ancient competitors like the gars, sturgeon, and bowfin. Despite this, the older lineages of bayfin fishes still had much greater diversity than what we see today. There were still multiple species of bowfin still swimming around, for example. By the Eocene, most modern Teleos lineages had appeared in a recognizable form. Ipsidorus is one of the most well preserved representatives of a failed offshoot of one of the most successful fish orders on the planet, the catfishes. As Hypsidorus oregonensis alludes, these fishes inhabited waters in what we now know as the northwestern United States. The Clarno and Green River formations in Oregon contained the best preserved specimens of Hypsidorus and many other mostly extinct fish lineages. To understand Hypsidorus better, let's dive into an explanation of these formations. These aforementioned formations are lodger stodden, or areas of uncommonly well-preserved fossils, located near a fault line in Oregon. Fault lines oftentimes mean volcanoes and or earthquakes, as the rapid shifting of Earth's crust, at least in geological terms, occasionally leads to rapid, in human terms, changes in the landscape above. Let's get back to lodger stodden. As you probably know, most dead organisms don't sit on the ground forever when they die. Scavengers, the weather, and decomposers all conspire to make sure corpses vanish without a trace. Sure, these forces may be slower than your average serial killer, but they're almost guaranteed to work over time. But, what if, somehow, you are able to protect an organism's corpse from the effects of predators and the elements? This is where the fault lines come in. Rapid deposition of ash from a volcano or a mudslide from an earthquake quickly covers in sediment any organisms in its path, leaving them rather dead. However, this process basically flash, flash freezes the organism in time, as it's kept safe from the elements for millions of years, until a curious human goes and digs it up. In the case of the Oregon Lodgestodden, the late Sipsidorus and the, all the other fish they live with were quite deep, with an anoxic bottom layer made of soft sediment. Once a fish died, it often sank. The anoxic conditions kept away decomposing bacteria and threatened to make more fossils of any scavengers that happened to swim along searching for a free meal. Over time, these sedimentary layers built up, completely covering the watery grave of these hapless organisms. Enough talk about death. What was Hypsidorus like in life? Since I can't exactly go scoop one out of a creek or find one in a pet store, I have to infer what the fish was like from observing living catfishes, its bones, and by the other fishes of the Oregon Lodgerstodden. Based on fossil evidence, Hypsidorus was a moderately sized fish. Hypsidorus farsonensis reached 5 inches maximum, apparently, while Hypsidorus oregonensis had a maximum growth potential of 11 inches. Like most typical catfishes, it had a large, wide head, with highly fused bones, which form a layer of armor. Initially, Hypsidorus was brushed off as a member of the North American catfish family Ichthyluridae. Ichthylurids are, in my, and most likely everyone else's opinion, the most catfishy of the catfishes. That catfish you find in those supermarket tanks? That's most likely an Ichthylurid if you live in North America. Most Ichthylurids have ver very generalized catfish features, with nothing particularly notable sticking out besides a few species involving troglobitic or cave dwelling adaptations. Until closer inspection, Hypsidorus appeared to be the same way. 
After all, all we know of the species are its admittedly well-preserved bones. A 1987 paper took a closer look at some fossils and found something striking that few other modern catfishes have. A well-developed maxilla, or upper jaw, with teeth. Most modern catfishes, except for the primitive Diplomistidae, have toothless maxillae which are oftentimes atrophied. In these catfishes, the maxilla serves as a support for the maxillary barbels, or the ones you see around the fish's nose. Hypsodorus is maxillae the typical fish upper jaw things, most likely. This alerted the researcher that Hypsodorus was, was a primitive catfish indeed. Of course, there are other, more minor skeletal features that implied Hypsodorus had no living close relatives, but the toothed maxilla was the most major of these features. Since Hypsodorus was a fairly generalized looking catfish, we can assume it lived much like modern catfishes do today. As an implied bottom feeder, Hypsodorus probably competed with the sucker and mizen, the gonorrhynchid nodigonius, and the ectilurid catfish astephus for living space and food. Hypsodorus has similar needle-like teeth to other catfishes, plus a fairly wide mouth, so most likely had a benthic carnivorous diet consisting of worms, crustaceans, and smaller fish. Based on its shape, it appeared to be a fairly sedentary fish. None of the fins looked like they were built for swimming long distances for a great speed, and the overall body shape isn't much different from a modern channel catfish. Hypsodorus also possessed fairly large orbits, implying the fish had large eyes. This was probably a sign of either decent eyesight, and or a nocturnal lifestyle. Being active during the darker hours most likely kept the fish safe from diurnal predators like birds and allowed it to potentially catch smaller fish sleeping. Hypsodorus fossils were also apparently found only in the deeper parts of the lake in small quantities compared to other fish species. This implies that the fish lived in small populations, ventured into the lakes it was found in on accident, or was quite rare at the time of fossilization. Hypsodorus has no known living or fossil relatives anywhere else on the planet, so how it ended up in what's now Oregon is a mystery. Most of the North American freshwater ichthyofauna has some connection with Southeast Asia, since both continents were both part of one giant landmass called Laurasia millions of years ago, plus they could have just simply crossed the ancient land bridge Beringia linking these two continents. The catfish lineage, as far as we know, probably involved sometime during the Cretaceous in what is now South America, before going to land or an amalgamation of South America, Africa, and Australia fully broke up. South America is the continent with the highest variety of catfish species, and several early branches of the catfish lineage still reside there currently. Due to many parts of the continent being hard to access, especially the Andes Mountains, home to a few primitive catfish species, we can't know for sure if that's where Hypsodorus' lineage is specifically originated. Hypsodorus therefore may represent an example of relic lineage. A clade that was once widespread, but for whatever reason exists only in an isolated area. Catfishes themselves originated sometime within the Mesozoic, most likely the Cretaceous. Back then, Gondwana land was starting to break up, and Pangaea, the original giant landmass, had been a distant memory. Apparently, fossils from the modern catfish family Areidae were found in the late Cretaceous, so the four major catfish lineages had probably all evolved before the dinosaurs got eaten. Fossil evidence is still hard to come by, so this is largely conjecture until somebody starts paying schmucks to start digging up the planet in search of fossils. Since only two of these lineages, the highly diverse and South America restricted Lorcaroidae, and the nearly cosmopolitan, almost as diverse Siluroidae, are present in major quantities outside the Andes, we can imply the maxillary tooth-bearing lineages simply got out-competed. The most primitive of these, the Diplomistoidae, hangs on by a thread in the most temperate regions of South America. If one wants to guess what the ancestral catfish would probably look like, look no further than Diplomistes. It's yet another moderately sized bottom feeder, but this time with small eyes, and skeletal features closer to those of tetras and knifefish than the rest of the catfish lineage. As far as the quite lacking information online says, Diplomistes is yet another nocturnal journalist catfish, making it quite similar niche-wise to Hypsodorus. Diplomistes faces threats from introduced species and anthropogenic pollution. Problems Hypsodorus never had to face, sadly. Hypsodorus is a tiny footnote in a long sprawling saga that is life on Earth. Heck, 
it's fairly minor and unimportant in comparison to all the other catfish lineages today. However, it was an interesting relic that adds even more interest to the Oregonian Lodgerstata. Will fossils of its close relatives turn up somewhere? Could we find a living example high in the Andes in a remote area? Highly unlikely, but it's a fun idea. Thanks to Edge for coming up with the idea of Fossil Fish February. This is quite fun, and I might revisit Asian fishes sometime in the far future, after I clear my backlog of upcoming projects.